Welcome to Malibu Books. Thanks for coming out tonight um, on uh, this beautiful summer night here in August in Austin. And uh, welcome to the store. I hope you have a chance to look around. We have uh, the translator's books are over there on the table, along with some of Marcella's original poetry. And uh, there are books around the store. And it's just fun to check it out. And please eat the food. Otherwise, you know, I don't know. I have to take it home. I don't need that. OK. Our first reader tonight is Marian Schwartz. Marian has translated Russian classic and contemporary fiction, history, biography, criticism, and fine art for over 40 years. No oh, way. 40? What are you, about 35? OK. She is the principal English translator of works of Nina Berberova and has retranslated half a dozen Russian classics, including Leo Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. Uh, in addition to half the stories in calligraphy lesson, the collected stories of Mikhail Shishkin, she also translated Shishkin's novel Maiden Hair for open letter books. Forthcoming in January 2017 is her translation of Andrei Kolosimov's novel Into the Thickening Fog. Marianne. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is great. Uh, this is, um, as Joe said, this is uh, the second volume that I've been involved with with Shishkin. He is a contemporary writer. He's a very celebrated uh, writer. He's also he's won every major Russian prize. And he lives in Switzerland. He's also a translator. So he often the act of translation is, is interesting to him. Not, however, in the story I'm going to read to you. This book, uh, I'm not going to read the whole story. The story is called Calligraphy Lesson. And it's a story I translated a long time ago that appeared on Words Without Borders. If you want to know more about the story and about Shishkin, go to wordswithoutborders.org and you can find a lot more about him. Um, it's an odd story, uh, and the, this volume has fiction and nonfiction both in it. It's essays of his that are um, will be a, that are they're all wonderful. He's a fabulous writer. Um, calligraphy lesson is set in a courtroom, um, and there's this, the scribe in the courtroom is obsessed with um, writing, with letter writing, with calligraphy. He's writing these trial reports. And it's kind of a defense mechanism for him against both what he's hearing in court and also a tragedy that's unfolding in his life, none of which I'm going to read to you about. But part of it, uh, what happens with him is that he's obsessed with calligraphy, and he also has this running game in his mind of where he's speaking with um, heroines of Russian literature. So when a Russian reads these books, uh, reads these stories, and they see Sofia Pavlovna, they know immediately that this is a main character from Grivayev's play, Wolf from Lit. Or if he hears um, Anna Arkadyevna, you know it's Anna Karenina. So it's, there's, uh, that is going on. It's Sofia Pavlovna will come up in this. Um, and I'm going to read just a little bit from the beginning to give you a taste of it. Um, uh, and then I'm going to read something more about the calligraphy aspect of it from the very beginning. The capital letter, Sofia Pavlovna, is the beginning of all beginnings. So let us begin with that. It's like a first breath, a newborn's cry, you might say. Just a moment ago, there was nothing, absolutely nothing, a void. And for another hundred or thousand years, there might still have been nothing. But suddenly, this pen, submitting to an impossibly higher will, is tracing a capital letter. And now there's no stopping it. Being the pen's first movement toward the period as well, it is a sign of the, both the hope and the absurdity of what is simultaneously. The first letter, like an embryo, conceals all life to come to the very end, its spirit, its rhythm, its force, and its image. 
Don't go to any trouble, Evgeny Alexandrovich. I'm just a little chick, and this is just my scratching. Why don't you tell me something amusing? Interesting things happen at your work every day, after all. All those crimes, murderers, prostitutes, and rapists. Good God, what criminals? They're ordinary people. One blind drunk, another out of his mind, commit God knows what atrocity, and are now thoroughly horrified themselves. We have no idea, they say, not a clue. And anyway, how could you even think that I, fine, upstanding man that I am, might do something like that? So they write petitions and solicitations, and then more petitions and solicitations, begging for mercy, but no one has the slightest notion of how to hold a pen. Allow me to demonstrate. Lay the left side of the middle finger down by the nail against the right side of the pen, like this. Lay the thumb, also close to the nail, against the left side, and let the index finger rest but not press on top, as if it were stroking the pen's back. The pen rests against the base of the index finger's third joint. These three fingers are called the writing fingers. <coughs> Neither the pinky nor the ring finger should touch the paper. There should always be space, air, between the hand and the paper. If the hand is constrained and lies on the paper, if even the tip of the pinky rests there, <coughs> the wrist has no freedom of movement. The pen must touch the paper lightly, easily, without the least tension, as if it were simply plain. The pinky and ring fingers, I assure you, are nothing but bestial atavisms, and one can both write and make the sign of the cross without them. <coughs> You see, I can never get anything right. For instance, a few days ago, I decided to drown myself. Really, don't laugh. I dashed off a note and taped it to the mirror. But first, for some unknown reason, I decided to stop in at the bathhouse. I have no idea why. Oddly enough, I remember this one sturdy woman washing her red hair across from me. She was sprinkled all over with freckles on her breasts, her belly, her back, her legs. Her hair was thick and long and soaked up so much water that when she straightened up, the wash tub was nearly empty, and an entire waterfall came crashing down into it. When I finally got to the bridge, a barge was drifting by below. The men down there shouted something and laughed as if to say, come on, jump. I waited for it to pass, but right behind came another barge, and another. They kept shouting and laughing from each one, and there was no end to those barges in sight. All of a sudden, it struck me as funny, too. So I went home, arriving before anyone else, thank God. I took down the note, grabbed a loaf of bread, and gobbled up the whole thing practically. Actually, this is all totally beside the point. Go on. Now where were we? <coughs> Why don't we move on to the line then? But first, sit up straight and relax your shoulders. You can't write hunched over or at, or at attention. You see, at the basis of everything is the line, the stroke. Take any two points in space any two objects, and you can draw a line connecting them. There are these invisible strokes between all the things in the world. They make everything interconnected, unseverable. Distance is totally irrelevant. These lines can stretch like rubber bands, which only makes the connection, connections between the objects stronger. You see, there's a line stretching between the inkwell and this ace that flat fluttered down to the parquet between the piano pedal and the branches shadow on the windowsill between you and me. It's like a tendon that keeps the world from falling apart. The pen-drawn line is that connection materialized, so to speak. And letters are nothing but strokes or lines held together by knots and loops or stability. The pen ties the line to the form, the shape, and endows it with meaning and spirit, humanized, humanizing it, so to speak. Try to draw a straight line. All right, now admire this trembling, curly hair. Mortals can't draw a straight line. A straight line is nature's unattainable ideal toward which myriad curves aspire. Just as letters cling pell-mell, so too do they all have an inherent harmony and beauty in the symmetry of their curves, the impetuosity of their slant, the correctness of their proportions. The pen is merely the registrar that fault faultlessly imprints on paper every dream and fear, every virtue and vice, taking us by the arm each time we press down. Everything that happens in your life immediately ends up on the tip of your pen. 
tell me about someone, and I'll tell you exactly what kind of handwriting that person has. So I'm going to skip ahead now, and you've got your word. Everybody's got a word, right? Um, he does this absolutely brilliant tour de force of um, describing, it's a description of the word and what the letters look like. And he anthropomorphizes and, um, I mean, he's talking about the calligraphy actually of a, unfortunately, I, I didn't think of it when I was doing it, but he's talking about the script, cursive and not about the printed letter, which, which is what you've got. Um, the important thing about the word, niftir pyosh, is that it's a word he's heard in, in a court of law, but it's a very upsetting word. It doesn't belong in a court of law. It's, it's out, of, out of connection to the, it's, it's uh, incompatible with its, its situation. And it becomes very powerful, and it, it acquires a lot of emotional power. And as a result, he focuses on it, and he describes he he describes the letters as letters, as physical objects. Okay. Now the question is, how do you translate that? Because these are Russian letters, right? They're not English letters. Well, the French translator translated the word and then wrote a new description describing the French letters. I'm perhaps not that audacious that I think I can come up with a, a, a comparable, comparably amazing description. And in this day and age, it's not that hard to put Cyrillic letters into the text. When I was first starting out, it meant like really cutting out letters and pasting them on the proofs, but it, it, not anymore. So you can include letters. So I decided to describe the Russian letters and include them and use his description, which is so brilliant that I'm much happier having that on the uh, page. So the word is Niftir Pyosh, and I will find the description. Okay. Um, Niftir Pyosh. What that one word costs, just try it. The primitive n, the first letter, I'm going to tell you which letter we're talking about. The primitive n may not merit special attention. Mention its crossbar is written on a slant in a single stroke. You place the tip of your pen at the beginning, then bend your fingers right away, and the pen itself pulls you down. But the main thing here is the pressure. God forbid you press too hard or lift too much because the line isn't supposed to breathe. The flame-like shape, because it does resemble a tongue of flame, bends first to the left, then the right. It gets fatter in the middle and dwindles to nil at the ends. On the third beat, the stick has a curve at the bottom. The first five sections of the line are drawn straight, but on the sixth, the pressure eases up and the line, rounding, drifts off to the right, ending at the invisible line that confines, confines each letter to its allotted space, itself, you might say. I forgot to add that in Russian, they do a, a quadrille line, they do a square, they have a, put each word letter in a square when they're going to write. So that's the cell. Uh, between the imagined field of the cell and the tip of the line it contains, you get an empty corner. After the curve, the fine line goes up, not straight up, but in an arc, bending slightly to the right so as not to lose contact with the page and break, and break through to the yaw a cunning ninny, unprepossessing to look at, but demanding caution and deft treatment in order to achieve the desired end. After the clumsy snub-nosed no, that first letter, the ye, yeah, the next letter, requires a light, graceful line that begins with an eyelash stroke and a bend to the right, cuts across the middle evenly on an incline, flies back after the bend, nearly grazing the ceiling of its chamber, and as it falls back in its noose, rushes into the half oval with pressure on the left side. Moreover, the bend of the capillary outline is hidden in the half oval, but is not left behind. After a break, the pen heads all the way to the upper corner of the next cell. The merest trembling or thickening could instantly destroy the illusion of this free soaring, which takes a drastic gain in altitude to become a buff. That's the third letter. The secret essence of this spindle leg 
lies by no means in the spaces that run through it from top to bottom, but in the concluding, unremarkable, but danger-laden sign-off loop, beyond which the T is already twitching impatiently. Here it's important not to be too hasty in imprinting the tightening loop, but to wait for the loop to turn almost into a period. Then you can rush headlong into three holes in a row, returning happily once again to the ye, re, and p, which is hardly a letter, just a g on a stick. <laughs> um, but onward, onward to the very end, and the je. That's so. This is the last letter he's talking about. The je. That amazing anthropod peahen, the only one that falls into a full five beats. There's something of the two-headed eagle to it, and at the same time, its soft half ovals sit firmly on the line, like on a perch. It seems to clamp an unraveling world together, heaven and earth, east and west. It's elegant perfect and sufficient unto itself. And now, if the hand was true, if the pen didn't shake once, if everything came together, then you won't believe it. A miracle takes place at my desk. A sheet of ordinary paper breaks free and rises above events. Its perfection immediately yields an alienation, a hostility even, toward all that exists, toward nature itself, as if another higher world, a world of harmony, had wrested this space from that kingdom of worms. They may hate and kill each other, betray and hang themselves there, but it's all just raw material for my penmanship, fodder for beauty. And during those astounding minutes, when you feel like writing nonstop, you experience a strange, inexpressible feeling. Truly, this is happiness. Evgeny Alexandrovich, you're insane. <laughs> <laughs>